introduced this panel on Bible translation in Germany, which is an all Oxford panel. So we have um, Howard Jones, Henrique Lehnemann, and Daniel Lloyd. And the panel has a slightly different format in the sense that Henrique is going to give us an introduction before, before the papers. And then the papers will take us through Bible translation in Germany from the beginning to the end, which is quite a feat for an hour and a half. Um, so, yeah, I'll hand over to Thanks a lot. It's uh, uh, an exciting opportunity to work uh, with colleagues across uh, the disciplines because uh, you have here a historical linguist, um, he as a literary scholar, and then Daniel as a priest, all but uh, going back to some Oxford form of um, German medieval uh, studies, as it were. And we, we thought we would uh, use this prism of uh, theology to shed light on what makes Bible translation uh, so special and doubly special um, in the context <coughs> of uh, German translation studies. And I, I thought we should start uh, with St. Jerome, since we are in the octave of his uh, feast day on the 30th of September. St. Jerome, in the guise of a German scholar, you see him as pictured by Albrecht Dürer, um, doing it during the time of um, uh, Luther and showing him as the prototypical translator surrounded by uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Septuagint on the left-hand side and his own Latin um, uh, Vulgate translation all opened at uh, Genesis uh, 1, um, verse 1. So how we are going to run it is um, that we are looking at this translation um, trajectory and the different modes of coping with a unique text that is um, the uh, Bible because um, uh, Bible has uh, the, the challenge of being a sacred text, and actually uh, Christianity is the only of the three book religions which allow a translated version of sacred scripture to be used within uh, the liturgy or within the service. So um, neither the Quran nor um, the Hebrew Bible for the Jewish service um, was ever allowed to be uh, translated for other purposes than for just um, understanding it outside of the sacred service. So um, we look at um, close translation in uh, the Middle Ages, then at uh, Luther's attempt to establish a colloquial translation of uh, the Bible, and then at a very new um, attempt to um, deal differently with this heritage by having something called uh, in gerechter Sprache, in just language. You have um, an image from these three different translations on your two sides of the handout. I've also uh, copies here from uh, these three stages, which I can circulate while this, so this is the, the first. Um, this might be a bit heavy to circulate, so I'll uh, leave it here. That's Luther, and um, <laughs> that's uh, the Bibel in gerechter Sprache. All right, um, I'll start with a whistle-stop tour from antiquity to the Middle Ages. And, uh, point out just um, with this colorful slide with each color coded um, a different language, the translatedness of the Bible as a text, because um, it has in itself translation processes. So if you take um, the Gospels, written down in Greek by Aramaic, uh, Aramaic native speakers, um, quoting from uh, the Septuagint, if they are quoting the Hebrew Bible, they aren't quoting the Hebrew, they are quoting from the translated version of uh, the Jewish uh, scripture. So integrating um, already translated material and um, also 
if they are referring to any uh, thing uh, Jesus said, quoting from an oral Aramaic source <coughs> in uh, Greek. Uh, and also to have these, um, have writers with a, a completely different ability in Greek writing from the very basic rustic Greek of um, Mark to a very refined, um, learned Greek of uh, St. Paul. Um, and so uh, nearly from the beginning, there are uh, translations into the other vernacular of the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire being more or less bilingual Greek uh, Latin, the Vetus uh, Latina, uh, which represents different attempts on, of making the most important books for service available in the vernacular. And uh, Jerome's translation, the Vulgate, called so, um, so the uh, version in the vernacular, um, was the attempt to standardize these different steps at translation um, and also to translate uh, both um, also the, um, what had become the Old Testament for uh, the Christians again <laughs> from the source text. So um, no talk about any vernacular Bible translation can um, do without Jerome, whose uh, significance for translation studies, and particularly for the Bible, are mainly in, in three uh, factors. It's uh, he who, um, in his prologues to the different uh, biblical books, <coughs> in arguing with his critics, um, formulates the basic um, opposition between sense for sense against a word for word uh, translation. Leaning himself very much towards a sense for sense translation, but um, including the very important proviso, except in the case of Holy Scripture, where even the order of the words is a mystery. So from um, that point on, he was called upon as patron saint both for uh, sense for sense translation and for word for word translation in the Bible. Um, each um, later translator stressing a different aspect of his translation um, work. Uh, then it's uh, his battle cry, the turn to the sources, Hebraica Veritas, the Hebrew truth. Um, that is then taken up again in um, the uh, Reformation and in the Renaissance, and uh, the problematization of the special significance of uh, or the special challenge Bible translation poses. He um, reports um, uh, to illustrate his dilemma, um, a dream he had where he comes to heaven's door asked to be let in, the angel says, who are you? And he says, Christianus sum. And the uh, angel says, no, you aren't uh, Christianus, you are Ciceronianus. You uh, hold more uh, with uh, Cicero's uh, rhetorical brilliance than with Christian uh, literal truth. And quotes this as his turning point for using just for the Bible a word for word rather than a sense for sense translation. And this word-for-word -word, um, emphasis for translating the Bible is taken up by most Bible translations we see in uh, the Middle Ages. And I've, just to give you an example from, from England, called up uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, where you see the beginning of the Gospel according to Matthew. You see uh, here the word liber, which is glossed as book, um, and then incipit evangelii genealogia Matthei uh, is glossed on Guinness God spellis. So the genitive evangelii is um, uh, represented by um, uh, uh, translating each part of the word oi angelion with a God 
good uh, spelled, um, and, and, and so on. So, uh, and Howard will uh, talk more about this kind of close translation as an extreme form of uh, a translation. A form of translation Schleiermacher, for example, wouldn't call uh, a translation at all. Uh, and um, even then, when the gloss um, uh, tears away, as it were, from the source text and turns into a continuous text, you can still match it word for word uh, with a, a source text. And the source text throughout the Middle Ages from um, Jerome's time is always the Vulgate. So um, uh, from Jerome to, uh, through to Luther, uh, you have uh, always the Latin as becoming the new source text. And the alternative for the Middle Ages is just to have a free paraphrase. Again, something that Schleiermacher wouldn't term as a translation, the, um, but just um, as a way to circumvent the challenges. And um, you have uh, this type of paraphrase because it also uh, allows you to include commentary elements. So um, I've taken as an example the uh, Bible epics by Gott Ottfried uh, von Weissenburg, uh, 9th century, so at the same time Howard is uh, talking about in a moment um, with a close translation. And um, he, here he takes the Our Father, so libera nos a malo, uh, deliver us from evil, and turns it into lösi unsich, so deliver us, that's literal translation, and then he goes into a, a commentary, Losi unich uh, jodanana, das wir sin dine degana, joch mit gnaden dienen, den wewon jo bemiden. So it's a whole uh, commentary, what does it really mean to uh, deliver us from evil? So over to Howard now for uh, an example of close Thank you. The pre-Luther German Bible translations are very close to their originals. In fact, some would say slavish. And uh, it makes one wonder whether these are promising sources for the historical readers at all. Uh, I hope to show that, that they are. <coughs> uh, let me just outline what medieval German Bible translations there are, then give you an example of how close close is. And then look at a couple of examples uh, where these early German Bible translations help the historical linguist. First, synchronically, giving a sense of the language in its time. And second, diachronically, giving us a sense of the language uh, over time. We divide the uh, medieval German period into two parts. Old High German up to 1050. Uh, Middle High German 1050 to <laughs> 1500. In Old High German, there weren't any Bible translations. There were odds and sorts. <coughs> of the Bible which were translated. The nearest thing we have is this animal um, from around 850. It's an old High German translation of uh, gospel harmony. Uh, the dear tessero means through four, so through the four gospels, uh, a version of the life of Christ was cobbled together. And the Latin from which it was cobbled together comes broadly under the heading of the Vetus Latina, which is a sort of collective term for pre-Vulgate um, uh, Latin uh, Bibles. So what we can do with this is we can, if you like, um, disassemble it and put it together to form as much of the four Gospels as we can. Um, the Old High Germantation, as I'll call it, looks like that in its most complete manuscript, with the Latin down the left and the Old High German on the right. It was almost certainly used, it was almost certainly written by monks or the scribes working for monks um, to help other monks with their understanding of Latin. In the Middle High German period, there's not much that's new <coughs> until about 1300, and from 1300 onwards, we do find more complete Bible translations of the Old and New Testaments. And uh, from 1466 onwards, we find that some of these early Bible translations appear in print, and the first German 
language Bible translation was produced by Mentel, who's uh, an apprentice of Gutenberg. Um, and it is a print of a Bible translation which is thought to have been made uh, about a century before. <coughs> the Mentel Bible, as we will see, um, is like the Old High Germantation, a very close translation. So how close is close? Well, if we look at the Tatian translation, we have the Latin on the left and the Old High German on the right. And it's not actually word for word, as we'll see. It's not sense for sense. It's line for line. Meaning that if you looked at any line of the Latin, uh, you would find that the contents of that line correspond to the adjacent line of the Old High German. The order of the elements might be different, but the content of one line corresponds to the content of the line in the other language immediately to its right. Um, so, writing down what we had on the previous slide a little bit more legibly, I'm going to look more closely at John 17, verses 1 to 2. Um, I've given a very literal translation on the right, but <coughs> broadly speaking we have these things Jesus said, and with eyes raised to heaven, he said to the Father, uh, the hour has come, glorify your son, so that your son may glorify you, uh, just as you have given him the power of all flesh. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through the Old High German, but I'm going to pick out one or two examples of close translation in a second. So, we had in the manuscript the Latin on the left and the Old High German on the right. On the next slide, to make things more easy to, com to make things easy to compare, um, I put the Old High German under the Latin, and I've also separated out, separated out the Latin and grouped together sentence constituents. So within each sentence constituent are words that go together to form a syntactic unit, noun phrase, prepositional phrase, and so on, with spaces between them. Now, if we try and match these up, we do it, or I do it in this case, by numbering each sentence constituent in the Latin and seeing how the Old High German corresponds to it. So in the first line, we have sentence constituents in the order 1, 2, 3 in the Latin, and they match the Old High German 1, 2, 3. And in fact, if you look at all of these sen sentence constituents, uh, which total 21, you'll find that the Old High German follows the Latin order in every case except for two, um, there are a couple of reversals only. I won't mention them now, but I'll look at them more closely in a second. What we haven't seen here is the order of the words <coughs> within each set sentence constituent. But just to give you an idea, the order um, among the sentence constituents is very close. <coughs> if we do the same thing from the Mentel Bible, this Bible that was translated about 500 years later, um, the layout is slightly different because whereas the Tatian translation was line for line, the mental translation was not. It didn't have the Latin on the facing page. And also the Latin in the mental translation is the Vulgate rather than the Vetus Latina. In any case, it also has 21 sentence constituents. Um, if we do the same exercise, <coughs> we find, if we go through carefully, that there are four changes of order here among the 21 sentence constituents. So a little bit less close, but nonetheless still very close. So the question is, how can this possibly be helpful to the historical linguistic? Well, in a nutshell, the reason is this. <coughs> because the translations are so close, we have a fair idea how the sentence constituents, if we look at it at that level, match up one to the other. But we also can see very c conspicuously where the translator departed from the order of the Latin. And the departures from the order of the Latin could be explained either by chance, there could be some random distribution of departures, or they could be systematic. And if we find that the departures are systematic, then I think we can be forgiven for concluding that the translators were prepared to override the default setting, which was to go word for word, in order to create Old High German, which was acceptable, and to avoid Old High German, which was unacceptable. So, to give you an example, coming back to the Tatian, John 17, 1 to 2, setting out the Latin and the Old High German the same way that I did just now, I just want to focus on three 
sets of um, changes that were made by the old High German translator to the Latin, um, which illustrate very widespread systematic changes across the translation. <coughs> the first one is this. You'll see in line one we have uh, the name Jesus, and line three the preposition phrase ad, ad patrem. In neither case in the Latin is there a determiner. Whereas in the Old High German we have der Heiland, the Saviour, and uh, demo vater, this is the dative of um, uh, <coughs> the determiner, which is the ancestor of, deity, uh, ancestor of deity das. Now, we know from very early texts in Old High German that uh, the ancestor of deity das was probably a demonstrative determiner. By demonstrative, I mean referring to picking out one of a, a number of possible reference and choosing a referent within the vicinity of the speaker. So if it would tr translate any Latin determiner, it would translate iste or ile. Now you'll see that in Latin there is no such determiner, and yet we still have uh, there. And the function of there here seems to be anaphoric, seems to be referring to the saviour already mentioned, namely Jesus, uh, and the father already mentioned, namely um, God the Father. And this is used as evidence that already at the, in the early to mid 9th century, this determinant there was being used as an article, as a definite article, rather than just as a demonstrative. Second set of cases I want to look at are cases where there's an adjective, where there's a noun phrase, and the noun is qualified by an adjective. So if you look at line two, we have in the Latin adjective plus noun in that order, and that order is retained in the Old High German. Uh, same in line seven, the order adjective plus noun retained in the uh, Old High German. In four and five, you can see that the Latin has the opposite order. We have noun followed by, in this case, possessive adjective, filium tuum or filius tuus. And what's happened in the Old High German is that order has been reversed. So this which is an example of a very systematic set of changes in the uh, Old High Germanation, suggests that the unmarked order at this time was adjective followed by, um, followed by noun. The third set of changes is to do with verb, um, verb positions in subordinate clauses. So, take this sentence, <coughs> take this clause in five. We have, in order that your son may glorify you. And in the Latin subordinate clause, we have the finite verb which precedes the um, personal pronoun. This has been reversed in the Old High German. Dich gebärech to. That's cognate with the English verb brighten. Um, similarly here, in this subordinate clause, just as you have given to him power, in the Latin we have the uh, finite verb and subordinate clause which precedes the uh, personal pronoun. That is changed in the Old High German, you to him have given. And these, as I say, are examples which are replicated across the Old High Germanation and suggest that the, that, that, that the change, changes were systematically made by the translator. I should add that there's another difference here, that the Latin doesn't have a subject pronoun, no, it's not too dedisti, um, whereas the Old High German does in, insert do. Um, and this is another change which is found systematic, namely that um, within subordinate clauses, uh, Old High German sticks in a subject pronoun where it doesn't exist in the Latin. So, <coughs> we see a series of short-range patterns from the translation behaviour in the Old High German. De das uses a definite article, not just as a demonstrative. Word order in noun phrases is adjective plus noun, unmarked word order. Unmarked word order in subordinate clauses is personal pronoun plus and then verb. And the subject personal pronouns are obligatory of verbs in certain contexts. And we saw the context of subordinate clauses. Turning to the evidence that these Bible translations provide diachronically, we can compare evidence from, for example, the Old High German translation with the uh, Middle High German mental translation. And I'm going to take as an example the translation of the passive. Now, in modern German, the passive can be formed with one of two auxiliaries, either werden, <coughs> which outside the passive means to become, or with sein, meaning to be. And there's a pretty clear division of labour 
between verb and passive and sign passive, if not a complete clear division of labour. Namely, that verb and passives are used to denote events and sign passives are used to denote states. Um, so, for example, uh, do, <coughs> if we want to say the door is opened in the same in the sense of being opened, uh, we say die Tür wird, using part of werden or wurde in the past, geöffnet. If we want to say the door is uh, opened, in other words, it's in a having been opened state, it's in a resultant state of opening, we use uh, ist or um, in the past bar. Okay. So there's a very, there's a complementary distribution between Verden and Sein, um, which corresponds to the semantic distinction between eventive and stative passes. So if the same pattern held in Old High German, we'd <coughs> expect that the Latin aperitur, the it is being opened, or aperta est, when we know it's eventive, would be translated with the corresponding forms of Verden. These are just the ancestors of the forms that we saw on the previous page. We do find these. We do find these. We also find that eventive passes are translated with sign. So we find that aperitur is translated like that. And aperta est, when we know it's eventive, is translated with um, was. Counting all the eventive passes in the old high germination, I find that 60% are translated with Verden and 40% uh, with sign. So between Old High German and <coughs> New High German, this 60% has become 100%, and that 40% has become zero. So let's compare how the same passes are translated in the mental Bible 500 years later. <coughs> Not all of the uh, Tatian passes are translated by mental passes, uh, but about 90% are. So we saw just now that... Um, Eventive passives in Tatian are translated 60% by Verden, 40% by Zein. And in fact, in modern German, that 60% becomes 100, and the Zein um, percentage becomes zero. In the Mentel Bible, we say that 84% of the eventive passives are translated by Verden. So this is certainly consistent with a hypothesis that the shift which we see between Old High German and uh, present-day German was already well underway in the medieval period. It's a, we can shed a bit more light if we break down those eventive passives. And I've broken them down into those which have past time reference and both those that have present time reference. And <clears throat> if we just take the eventive passives with past time reference, we see that there's a gentle increase between Tatian and Mental uh, in the percentage that are translated by Verden, which is towards the situation we find in, in modern German. So 53% goes up to 62%. If we look at present tense eventive passives, we find a much sharper progression. So 58 of those present tense eventive passives are translated by Verden in Tatian. 97% are translated uh, by Verden in Mental. So in other words, in the present tense, the modern German state of affairs has almost been achieved already in 1350. And this... <coughs> This breakdown is consistent with the hypothesis that the shift was occurring more or earlier in the present tense. And in fact, it's very, it's very satisfying that that hypothesis is confirmed because it's a feature of change in, changes in the Germanic verb system that, um, that uh, semantic distinctions tend to be retained longer or created <coughs> earlier in the present tense than in the past and the future. Perhaps because the sort of distinctions we're talking about are more salient in the present. Um, but in any case, um, the expectation that the present tense is where the action is seems to be confirmed by uh, what we see here. So, to conclude, um, Bible translations are in general useful to the historical linguists because however much debate there is about what the un underlying um, version means, People have debated it a lot, and therefore uh, we have perhaps a, a fair idea of what the range of meaning of the underlying um, is. The pre-Luther German Bible translations are very close to the Latin, we've seen. Um, the default choice, I think we can assume, is word for word. So other things being equal, as long as uh, the order in the target language was natural, 
uh, the default choice was word for word. But we do see departures from that. And if the departures are systematic rather than random, we have evidence, prima facie evidence, for what native acceptable patterns of the language were. Um, the other thing is that pre luther translations are also close to each other, as we saw with the Tatian and the Mentor, meaning that we can make very precise diachronic comparisons. We can compare how essentially the same text was translated at different points in the history of the language. The, the patterns we've, I've looked at so far <coughs> are to do with closed word classes, so articles and pronouns, word order, adjective plus noun, pronoun plus noun, in, uh, pronoun plus verb in that order, grammatical change, the inventive passive. Um, in other words, they relate to syntax and grammatical meaning. Um, quite narrow areas of linguistic study. But it so happens that uh, they provide information, they provide evidence, where the other texts that are not close translations leave important gaps in our understanding. So to that extent, very close translations that are not 100% word for word are a valuable source for the historical linguistic. So we have a state where uh, Jerome has become the default new inspired uh, Bible um, version for several hundred years and um, it's only in the uh, late 15th, early 16th century that uh, this position is put into question um, by, uh, not just by Luther, but by a whole bundle of new settings that came into um, place. And it um, required a whole host of different um, conditions to, to bring a move for a complete departure from this word-for-word -word translation about. And uh, some of the technological changes behind it are um, the new availability of uh, writing material, so um, paper rather than parchment uh, being available. Then uh, the printing press, uh, which for the first 30 years or so was more expensive than um, having handwritten copies. But um, by um, the early 16th century had become a very uh, affordable and effective way of mass production of uh, texts. And um, came at a time when there was also a literary explosion uh, in the sense uh, that people were putting uh, pen to paper who until then hadn't been able uh, because of low literacy uh, rates. So um, everything was put to um, paper and then also uh, to press. And that's um, the um, condition that Luther then finds for making his... Um, reform attempt at the church, which wasn't the first reform attempt that had come about. Uh, the whole 15th century was a wave of reform movements. But uh, his was the first to be able to draw on uh, these new uh, mechanical changes, but also the changes in learning. So Erasmus, uh, without Erasmus, Luther wouldn't have been able to go back to uh, the original sources because he had done a complete li revision of the Greek New Testament and had done a new Latin translation, um, a literal Latin translation that uh, allowed even um, weak um, Greek scholars, like Luther was one, uh, to work effectively with a, a source text. So. Um, there was the chance to break away to what had become um, a fairly untenable uh, state, because this is a copy of the Mentor Bible, 
uh, just to show you what vernacular text would have been available at, in Luther's time. Um, it's a manuscript copy of this print copy that was copied from a uh, manuscript. And it shows what happens if you take a literal translation. Because um, of having uh, contained uh, the word order, uh, the act of Judith taking down the mosquito net from um, the column in Holofernes tent and taking it away together with his head turned into her putting it in a cushion cover because uh, there was a mistranslation of the Colopeum plus uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, nicely um, uh, fashionable black and uh, uh, blue and white checkered cushion cover. Um, and um, the body is left behind as a trunk, which is uh, not uh, understanding that corpus eius truncum is a um, okay. split. Yeah. So um, there was an urge to read the Bible now in the vernacular, which for centuries hadn't been uh, there. A German Bible had been used to understand the Latin, uh, as we had seen in the uh, Tatian translation. But now um, there is the urge to read the uh, Bible in German, and the close translation isn't what um, is possible. So while up to um, here, all of the vernacular Bible translations go through the filter of Jerome's Vulgate, um, it's now possible through the new editions of the Hebrew source text and of the Greek source text to go straight back again to um, the uh, original <laughs> languages. And so the whole Reformation movement, um, as started by Luther, interlocks with uh, this translation process. So he translates as he needs it to um, get his arguments from the Bible supported by, by the text. Um, so he starts um, with the Psalms, which are uh, the most popular text, and he starts with the New Testament to support his um, thesis from um, uh, redemption through grace alone. And you see this uh, on the title page of the first full Bible, which has as title cut a programmatic image of this theology of redemption through grace. So you have on the left-hand side the law that is chasing Adam towards hell, death, and devil. And on the right-hand side, uh, Adam under the cross um, being redeemed by the stream of uh, Christ's blood uh, hitting him from above. Um, and this proved uh, incredibly controversial. Um, and Luther was accused of uh, doing a translation just to fit his arguments, um, which of course is the uh, danger if you aren't uh, doing a word-for-word -word translation, but trying to have an um, idiomatic translation. So he issued um, this Zendbrief uh, from Dolmetschen. I've uh, brought along one, um, um, a facsimile of the pamphlet as it's, um, it was issued in thousands of copies. One copy is in the Tellorian, so it's a reprint of the uh, Tellurian original, and uh, we want to uh, do a new uh, version of, of that for the Reformation Jubilee in two years' time, 2017, 500 years after um, the first uh, uh, Bible translation. So what he does there in this circular letter or, um, on translation is what Jerome did with his uh, prologues to the different Bible books that he um, uh, tries to defend his translation principles as the principles that are most appropriate for the for Holy <coughs> Scripture. And, but it's part of a propaganda war. So uh, for 10 years, uh, all presses in Germany were just busy with printing pro and contra uh, reformation. And just to show you, I've, uh, brought you two images of the seven-headed beast of the apocalypse, which on the left-hand side is Luther, on the right-hand side is the Pope. Yeah. Uh, what Luther
Luther does with his translation is that he includes um, commentary elements in the form of glosses here on the left-hand side, glossing difficult words. He structures it and he illustrates, illustrates it not with nice cushion cover uh, pictures, but rather trying to make specific points. So he, he wants to show that he is close in where, it, uh, where the detail matters, but um, that uh, he is um, working towards a meaning-based uh, translation. And um, he tell, takes for his main argument in the Zentri vom Dolmetschen uh, one example which he knows will uh, really um, um, anger all the um, Catholics reading it. Uh, he takes the Hail Mary, which is a kind of canonical text which everybody, even if they can't read and write, would know by heart. Um, and uh, he says, well, um, until now, uh, item da der Engel Mariam grüßet und spricht, gegrüßet seist du Maria voll Gnaden, der Herr mit dir. Wohl an, so ist's bisher schlecht den lateinischen Buchstaben nach verdeutscht. Sage mir aber, ob solch's auch gut Deutsch sei. So, uh, his criterion is, is it good German or not? And he says, well, nobody thinks of uh, grace when having the phrase full of. You uh, think of a, ihr muss denken an ein Fass voll Bier oder Beutel voll Geldes. Uh, darum hab ich's verdeutscht, du holdselige damit doch ein Deutscher desto mehr hinzu kann denken, was der Engel meinet mit seinem Gruß. Und hier wollen die Papisten toll werden über mich, dass ich den englischen Gruß verderbt habe, wiewohl ich dennoch damit nicht das beste Deutsch habe getroffen. Und hätte ich das beste Deutsch hier sollen nehmen und den Gruß also verdeutschen, Gott grüße dich, du liebe Maria, denn so viel will der Engel sagen und so würde er geredet haben, wann er hätte wollen sie Deutsch grüßen. So that's the key point. If he wanted... Uh, Uh, if he had addressed her in German, he would have spoken like that. Ich halt, sie wollten sich wohl uh, selbst erhängt haben für große Andacht zu der lieben Maria, dass sie den Gruß so zunichte gemacht hätte. Um, and his uh, main point is, um, you can't stick to the letter if you want um, to uh, get across the real um, message. Um, Pintjas Lapide, um, a German Jewish scholar, uh, said in his lectures on translation, translating the Bible, um, you can be either close or true to the Bible. Both isn't possible in translation. So um, that's his uh, main argument. If he wants to be true to the Bible, he has to let go of the letters. Die Buchstaben fahren lassen und forschen, wie der deutsche Mann solch redet, welcher der hebräische Mann Ishadumot redet. So, the significance of Luther is that he takes this sense for sense translation to Holy Scripture and that he returns to the um, source of the, the new philological insight of humanism and with a new focus on accessibility. Now to uh, get from there to 21st century, in one minute, um, we have Luther becoming a monument. That's why I've, um, so as Jerome had become the default Bible through the Middle Ages, <coughs> well, completely different from one he attended to because it, it was meant to be the vernacular Bible, the Vulgata, so Luther becomes uh, the default inspired uh, translation in the same way in which the King James Bible is um, being kind of um, petrified as the only possible. I uh, brought along here an 18th century reprint then of Luther's translation which is uh, just continued through uh, the centuries um, and finds actually its peak in the late 19th, early 20th century with Luther as a national hero. But then, of course, uh, with national socialism and with the problematization of uh, um, uh, the state church, um, 
and the complete breakdown of uh, the Deutsche Christen after um, World War II, uh, there was also a call for a new uh, reflection on Bible translation coming uh, from different perspectives and uh, leading to a situation where a new academic reflection is superimposed on all these translation movements that had been going on. And then we come to just translation. Thank you. I'm going to start by dethroning uh, Martin Luther, which I think is probably the way we'll go on with this. <laughs> So the Bibel in Gerechter Sprache uh, was published in 2006 as the result of some 52 translators working for around five years. It aims to be a truly inclusive translation, and since more than 80% of the translators were women, the list of contributors reads markedly differently from Bibles which went before it. It is lively, bold, imaginative, and in some places, particularly creative. I can say that it has made me think. What's more, it frequently brings to bear the best of literary and book-producing techniques, familiar perhaps in other genres, but alas not a regular feature of many printed Bibles. It has not been uncontroversial, and has probably as many detractors as it has fans. I've been asked to give a theological perspective on this translation, and I'll do so using three examples of particular decisions which have been taken as part of the making of this text, which might jump out at theologians, biblical scholars, and those who, for whatever reason, interact with the Bible on a regular basis. I'll try to explain why they're important, and I hope to show some areas where, from a theological perspective, this translation has done much good work, as well as perhaps one or two missed opportunities. Before I do that, let me start with the title. An English translation might be the Bible in just language, and I wonder whether this is a way in to establishing what a theological perspective on this translation might look like. I undertake this as a Catholic from a particular confessional stance. You may be aware that a few years ago, the Catholic Church in English-speaking countries undertook a thoroughgoing revision of the Roman Missal, that is, the collection of texts, the definitive and typical edition of which is the Latin, uh, which are used for public liturgical worship. The previous translation was undertaken following the lineaments of a document called Comme le Prévoi, and the new translation followed the principles of Liturgium Authenticam. There already in the title of those documents is a clue as to what was going on. The former translation was, to use the terms coined by the biblical scholar Eugene Nieder, one operating from a position of dynamic equivalence. The new translation leans heavily to formal equivalence. And so we found ourselves during Mass celebrated in English, speaking or singing the Latin words dinium et justum est, no longer as it is right to give him thanks and praise, but as it is right and just. Some saw in this a needless archaism, others found it a congenial return to the source. But the word just was a point, albeit one among many, where the different principles of translation had, or I should say have, a real impact on people who have in the main no interest at all in such issues as these. And so the Bible in just language, which might be more familiarly rendered the Bible in inclusive language, is a useful point of reflection for someone like me who finds myself in the position of what you might call a practitioner. But with the Bible in gerechter Sprache, we are dealing with a fairly new strand of biblical translation. Bibles which seek to assimilate principles of inclusive language in which women and men are not men in the plural, in which sisters are included with brothers, in which the standard operative category of human person is not making he the same as I. 
In English, the making of inclusive language Bibles took off in the mid-1980s, at a time when theologians like Jürgen Moltmann were writing lines such as these. God is a motherly father too. He is no longer defined in unisexual patriarchal terms, but if we allow for the metaphor of language, bisexually or transsexually. Among the first such texts was the American National Council of Churches' Inclusive Language Lectionary of 1983, and almost all mainstream versions of the Bible published since then have taken one stance or another on the use of inclusive language. It is revealing to read, a quarter of a century on, reviews of the new revised standard version of 1989, which praise the rendition of non-gender-specific Greek words such as anthropoi by using people or brothers and sisters uh, or through the use of plural pronouns, but also noting some curious inconsistencies of approach, even in these texts self-identifying as inclusive. The Bible in Gerechte Sprache, which acknowledges its debt to these Anglophone antecedents, takes as its base texts the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia and the Nestle Arland Novum Testamentum Greece, most recently republished in 1990 and 2001, respectively. I shall say a little bit more about the first of these choices later. For the few English translations I've used in my slides, I have tended to use the Revised Standard Version, partly because it is not a text which seeks to do much, if anything at all, in the way of inclusive language, and so demonstrates a different approach, partly because in its translations it represents a particular strand of English language Bible translations, and partly because in what it achieves it tends to be, if I can call it this, worthy but dull. As we have seen, there is something to be said about the way we translate gerecht as just or as inclusive. Justice is a cardinal virtue. As mishpat, it is not only an attribute of God, it is also a requirement placed on the people of God. What does the Lord require of you, says the prophet Micah, but to do justly and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? But whilst this is a helpful touchstone, others have pointed out the complexities in electing to render in German the term inclusive as gerecht. Robert Leicht, sometime editor of Die Zeit and sometime member of the Synod of the EKD, the Evangelical Church in Germany, has written this. The translation of the expression inclusive to just language leads to difficulties. In the introduction we read, the name Bible in just language does not make the claim that this translation is just and others are not. But why then this designation? which can be read as precisely that. So whilst I grant the different shades of meaning between justice and inclusivity, I do wish to underline that this was an editorial decision and consequently one which invites a reaction. And I think it's surely in the spirit of this translation to express an alternative view. I now turn to three examples of some of the other choices which have been made, not only in the translation of the text, but in the making of the book as a whole. And I shall begin, as the Bible itself does, in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. This was on the Hebrew Bible, which we saw on the frontispiece uh, in uh, Henrika's talk. The first word in Hebrew is Bereshit, translated in the beginning, in the RSV. And with all of these, in the Bibel in Gerechter Sprache, if I begin als Anfang, zu Anfang, durch einen Anfang, im Anfang, zu Beginn, am Anfang. In the preface, the editorial committee speak of the Vielstimmigkeit, the consort of many voices, as a chance, as an opportunity. It recalls the many contexts, people and groups amongst which the Bible has developed, and they have seen this reflected in their own collaborative and conversational translation process. There's also the legacy in German translation of, as we've heard, Martin Luther. He is name-checked twice, three pages in to the 21-page introduction, and he pops up again and again. The translators speak of die Freiheit Luthers, Luthers 
freedom, encouraging, emboldening us in our work. In the English translation tradition, the King James Bible and the Dowie Reams Bible were each collaborative pluralistic projects. Even John Wycliffe's role in translating the Bible in the 14th century was as a leading editor and not a sole translator. But although Luther had collaborators in his translation, not least, as Orrin Robinson points out, the printers who produced his texts, his is, it seems, thought a special kind of presiding genius. And what we see in the preface to the Bible in Gerechte Sprache is partly, I think, a reaction against the one-man band school of translation. Yes, one-man band school. Looking at the beginning of Genesis offers a good example of how such a polyphonic translation can be rendered in the text and on the page. But there is, in my opinion, a missed opportunity. The Hebrew text of Genesis, the Masoretic text, is the most usual choice for translators today. And they specifically say in the preface to this edition that they want to do so because of Jewish-Christian relations. But the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, probably begun in the 3rd century, and we've heard a little bit about it, the Septuagint, was the most widely used version at the time of the writing of the Gospels. Our oldest Septuagint fragments date from a century before the time of Christ. The oldest Hebrew manuscripts, the oldest Masoretic texts, are a thousand years later. It's enough to say that because of textual transmission, lacunae, other complexities of translation, the Hebrew, the Latin, and the Greek traditions, although they're generally close, do display some marked differences. But back to the beginning. The Gospel of John, too, begins in the beginning. And the Greek of the Gospel is identical to the Greek of Genesis in the Septuagint, Ein Arche. But in the Bible in Gerechte Sprache, although there is a marginal note which directs readers back to Genesis 1, 1, there is no attempt to repeat anything like this semantic cloud. The Norwegian theologian Pelle Borgen has argued that the Johannine prologue is a targumic exposition, that is to say it's a very particular kind of exegesis, exposition, meditation, commentary on Genesis 1.1. And to omit the opportunity to offer that link, when we have, at least by the standards of Bible translations, so creative an attempt to render the idea in the first place, seems to me a misstep. My second example looks at the way the Bibel in Gerechte Sprache treats an important New Testament noun. The Pharisees. The Pharisees were members of a strand of Judaism which came to prominence during the Second Temple era, and they figure largely throughout the Gospels. Today, Pharisee has a well-known pejorative tone, but this is a cliché, and it is a gross oversimplification, not only of the roles played by the Pharisees as a group in the Gospels, in history, but also of individual members of that group. John chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making more and baptizing more disciples than John, the Pharisees, the Greek is Pharisee. In the Bible in Gerechte Sprache, we have Pharisäerinnen und Pharisäer, female Pharisees and male Pharisees. Most scholars treat the Pharisees as an exclusively male group, or rather, most scholars do not interrogate the widely held view of them as such. But if you want to know why the Bibel in Gerechte Sprache feels justified in always and invariably referring to the Pharisees collectively as female and male, you need only go to their excellent website and search Pharisäerinnen, and a short paper is available explaining the decision. It must be said that the argument is far from conclusive, and that the earliest concrete reference to a woman seemingly taking her place among the Pharisees is dated to 200 years after the birth of Christ, by which time significant developments had taken place within Judaism. But there is an undoubted willingness to go out on a scholarly limb, and if the very unfamiliarity of the word Pharisäerinnen is a catalyst for further scholarship in this area, that can only be welcomed. 
My third example is one which poses difficulties from a theological viewpoint. What do they make of the rendition of the Greek huioi, sons, in the third and fourth chapters of St Paul's epistle to the Galatians? Everybody's first thought when they pick up a new translation of the Bible, I am sure. Huioi, the plural of huios, is given in older English translation as son or sons, but in contemporary versions it is often found as something like children or descendants. In Bibel in Gerechter Sprache we have Kinder. This is a helpful insight into how translation can shape theology. The background to the scriptural text is that it addresses the question of whether or not Christians in Galatia were obliged to follow the Mosaic law and its practice in first century Judaisms with specific reference to circumcision undertaken by adult male converts to the faith. Here, and in the specific part of the text in which we are interested, is where the following well-known passage is found. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's worth noting here that the Bible in Geresh Sprache is closer to the Greek than either the RSV is, or indeed the Latin Vulgate both of which continue neither nor, neither nor, neither nor, to the end of this tricolon, where the Bible in Gerech and the Greek end not male and female. Luk, eni, aner, hai, However, Galatians 3.26 and 4.7 use huioi, and this is translated, as I've said, kinder children in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So through God you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir. But this flattens out a distinction which scholars have argued the author in fact wishes to make. In his article, Editing the New Jerusalem Bible, Don Henry Wandsborough outlines the following as one of his principles of translation. Where possible to go some way towards using inclusive language, I did not estimate that this was necessary at all costs. I suggest this is an instance where it may not have been necessary. Why? Well, the English Standard Version, work on which began in the early 90s as a revision of the 1971 Revised Standard Version, the RSV, which was eventually published in 2001, contains the following note in its translator's preface. The English word sons, translating the Greek word huioi, is retained in specific instances because the underlying Greek term usually includes a male meaning component, and it was used as a legal term in the adoption and inheritance laws of first century Rome. That is to say, St. Paul is taking as the basis of his argument in this passage two forms of privileged masculinity. The first is that of the circumcised male. As N.T. Wright has noted, we sometimes think of circumcision as a painful obstacle for converts, as indeed in some ways it was. But of course, for those who embraced it, it was a matter of pride and privilege. It not only marked out Jews from Gentiles, it marked them out in a way which automatically privileged males. The second is the privileged masculinity of Roman inheritance law. Thus, the thrust of the rhetoric is in part to say that religion and custom make certain requirements which in the ordinary course of life many are barred from fulfilling, and that these requirements do not obtain under the Christian dispensation. It is also in part to say that those who are normally disbarred, whether they are Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female, enjoy through God in Christ the same position which in Roman society and in Jewish practices are given exclusively to sons. All are heirs and by analogy all are sons. To translate huioi as kinder then gives us the first part of the Pauline argument but not, I suggest, the second. To have said in the first century, all are sons and daughters, or all are descendants, or all are children, would have, I think, marred what was being said, because it would invite the natural objection that not all children inherit. To say that all are sons, with a capital S, is, it seems to me, for St Paul, a much more radical conclusion to which to come. It may well be that in the West, 
the rhetorical thrust is now diminished by not including everyone in that final flourish. But I think the exegesis of that is a task for the preacher and not for the translator. The Bibel in Gerechter Sprache should be commended for its willingness to find ways of putting into print the cutting edge, and yes, even in some cases, the fringe of contemporary biblical scholarship. I commend, too, its scholarly apparatus, and in particular, the willingness to make this available on the internet for open access, rather than restricted to institutional logins. Though there is an expressed desire to move away from some of the praxis bequeathed by Luther, striding the translation seem like a colossus, they go out just as he did into the marketplace, into the public square, and this is a refreshing change. There is much to be said for the bravery of allowing critique by anonymous comment as well as peer review. But my concern about this endeavour is that for all the imagination and for all the unusual vulnerability which this translation represents, there are times when it attempts to do too much of the audience's work for us. The feminist Catholic theologian Elisabeth Gussmann has pointed out Hildegard von Bingen's use variously of Deus, God, and Divinitas, divinity, masculine, and feminine nouns respectively, as a precursor for the Bibel in Gerechter Sprache's wide lexicon of names for God. But she argues that certain of the decisions taken in this translation make it Bibelauslegung und nicht Bibel, that is, interpretation of the Bible, and not the Bible itself. It runs the risk, she adds, of distorting the work done by other feminist theologians who would not be in agreement with this being the popular conception of feminist Bible scholarship. The Bible does not come out of nowhere. It is a received artefact. There is a history in its having been read as well as its having been written. There are parts of it which, as they have been received, are difficult, messy, misogynistic, frightening, and disturbing texts, and I demand those in their own strangeness. I'm unconvinced that the Bibel in Gerechter Sprache wants to provide, or succeeds in providing, that strangeness. However, I am grateful for what it has tried to do. If you want to come as well. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? No. no? Uh, okay. Our part is over. It's over to, uh, to you now. <laughs> uh,